Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome uh, to this event sponsored by the Orthodox Christian Studies Center entitled Musical Style and Tradition in American Orthodox Churches, Chant and uh, Polyphony. Uh, as a trained chanter myself, I'm uh, especially excited really to, uh, to follow and to listen along to this uh, uh, discussion today, as well as the one that we'll follow within two weeks. Uh, I uh, am here simply to introduce um, the organizer of this event to, to whom we are very grateful. But before I do that, uh, let me just simply um, um, promote, I guess is the right word, our Orthodox Christian Studies Center uh, to all of the participants. Uh, we invite you please to visit our website at uh, www.fordham.edu slash orthodoxy where you'll see a variety of content and many of the things that we do there. Um, I also invite you to visit our blog, publicorthodoxy.org, uh, to which uh, uh, Dr. Alex Lingus was, has been a contributor, and our YouTube page as well, where this will be posted afterwards, and where we have such series like uh, uh, Women Scholars of Orthodox Christianity and Orthodox Scholars Preach, and we invite you also, if uh, the content uh, is something that you find uh, good, uh, to like it as, as this sort of increases algorithms and allows people to uh, be exposed to the content of the Orthodox Christian Studies Center. So without further ado, again, I'm here just to uh, um, sort of begin the show. Uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Alexander Lingus, good friend uh, with whom it seems not too long ago we were together uh, in, in, in Oxford, chanting together the liturgy, which I still have a very, very dear memory of, really. And uh, I'm grateful to you for all the work that you do with Capella Romana and, and even beyond that. So uh, anyway, it's my honor to really uh, have you, uh, to, for us to host you here and for me to introduce you today. So without further ado, let me introduce you so you can take it away. Dr. Alexander Lingus is a professor of music at City University of London founder and musical director of the vocal ensemble Capella Romana and a fellow of the University of Oxford's Euro European Humanities Research Center. His present work embraces historical study, ethnography and performance. In 2018, his All Holiness Bartholomew I, Archbishop of Constantinople, New Rome and Ecumenical Patriarch, bestowed on him the title of Archon Musico Didascalos. I have to admit, I'm a bit jealous of that. So, <laughs> but, you, but you deserve it. You're in the line of some of the greats that we know, uh, great people like Pringos and Sanitas and so many of their great chanters because you do such great work in promoting uh, the Byzantine chant tradition and beyond. So anyway, uh, I'm going to go off the screen here and allow you to take over and really looking forward to this presentation. Thank you, Telly. And, and, uh very profound thanks to our to you and George, our friends at uh, Fordham at the Orthodox Christian Study, Study Center. I've been a frequent guest there for uh, symposia conferences, the, most recently the Arvo Pert uh, conference that was put on together with St. Vladimir's. So uh, it's really wonderful to be cooperating with you. And um, just to say that the, the, the purpose of these webinars, which are also part of Capella Romana's series of online explorations for the spring of 2021 is to shed light on contemporary challenges for sung worship in the Orthodox Churches of America. They will do, even though I live in England right now, <laughs> this is where I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, zooming in from, uh, they will do so by focusing on the musical elements so often ignored or taken for granted in pastoral or academic writing on Orthodox liturgy. I mean, other than everyone mentioning the uh, people who visited the emissaries of Prince Vladimir, who knew not whether they were in heaven or on earth. But beyond that, um, music needs to be part of the conversation in a serious way for a couple of reasons. It's integral to the traditions of corporate worship that are central to the ecclesiology, theology, and lived experience of Orthodox Christianity. And together with language, which will be the focus of the second webinar in two weeks, Music is one of the ways in which Orthodox services have been adapted over the past millennium for celebration in particular times and places. So, you know, you may have essentially the same liturgy served in different places, but the music may be very different. So today's topic is musical style and tradition in American Orthodox churches, particularly as it relates to two basic styles of music, 
chant, that means a single melodic line, um, whether performed by solo cantors or choirs, and polyphony, defined in its Greek sense as music sung in multiple parts, whether they all move together and, or, or uh, do more independent things. At first glance, this may seem like a kind of technical distinction from music theory that is irrelevant to non-specialists. And that's one of the reasons music doesn't get discussed so often in theological circles because people's eyes glaze over at the technical terminology. Um, historically, however, musical styles, practices, and repertories have served Orthodox Christians as oral badges of ethnic and confessional identity, as well as markers of piety or the perceived lack thereof. In some cases, Orthodox writers, even in very recent times, have gone so far as to condemn certain kinds of liturgical music as heretical. In modern times, immigration has created an unprecedented situation in the United States and certain other countries. Orthodox musical traditions that developed for centuries in isolation have been brought into close contact, not only with each other, but with a wide range of musics from historically non-Orthodox cultures. Advances in sound technology have since further complicated matters by making the full stylistic range of Orthodox liturgical music accessible to anyone with an internet connection. To help us explore the wider implications of differences in musical style within American Orthodox worship, particularly in the areas of the authority of tradition, the limits of enculturation and mission, I'm just thrilled to be able to introduce to you now three distinguished panelists. So uh, the first is Dorothy Berry, who is the digital collections program manager at the Houghton Library, Harvard University's largest repository for rare books and manuscripts, trained both as an ethnomusicologist and as an archivist. Her scholarship focuses on African-American history and culture, particularly the ways performing arts are integrated and interpreted in and outside of the community, which is very much what we're interested in today. As a performer, she studied 20th and 21st century vocal music in the famed experimental music department at Mills College while singing in Orthodox church choirs in Slavic and Byzantine traditions. Kevin Lawrence is the chair of the string department at the University of North Carolina School of the Arts and artistic director of the Green Mountain Chamber Music Festival in Vermont, active as a choir director and composer of liturgical music since 1985 his choral settings have been used in Orthodox parishes of several jurisdictions in the US at regional and national gatherings of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese and were sung at the World Council of Churches Assembly in Harare, Zimbabwe. In 2002, the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese honored him with its highest award given to church musicians, the St. Romanus Me uh, Medallion. Composer and conductor Benedict Sheehan is director of music at St. Tihon's Monastery and Seminary in Pennsylvania and artistic director of the St. Tichon Choir. His work focuses on the evolving tradition of Russian sacred choral music in 21st century America and on crafting a uniquely American sound within the Orthodox musical tradition. His efforts both as a composer and conductor have earned him widespread critical acclaim in recent years, including a 2021 Grammy nomination for best choral performance. So to, to set the stage, and to give you, our audience, some context for our discussion, I'd like to pause briefly and give you a musical example that illustrates some of the differences between chant and polyphony. And it, this example, it'll be the same hymn sung three different ways, will also serve to distinguish between musical perform and the style in which it's performed, the vocal style. So just allow me to share my screen here one moment. Right button here. Okay, so my uh, chosen example is a, a very well known hymn, the Hymn for the Holy Cross, Lord Save Your People. And I want to present it in three different versions. One in uh, Byzantine chant or psaltic music or ecclesiastical chant, the kind of style that was cultivated over centuries in the Eastern Mediterranean. And uh, so the first performance will be just of the straight chant, kind of in the way that people in the Eastern Mediterranean would expect to hear it sung.
So now the same hymn, still in Greek, still just unison melody with a, with a drone, but now as transcribed into Western staff notation by Frank Desby, Fotios Lesphotopoulos, who was director of music at St. Sophia Cathedral in Los Angeles for many years of the, in the Greek archdiocese. And he uh, instructed his choir to sing it in the way that he basically learned what chant sounded like in um, when he went to university here and to, to conservatory. So uh, here's the same hymn, still chant, but sung in a different style. And now the same hymn set for mixed choir for four part voices, soprano, alto, tenor, bass by Dr. Desby. So having established a kind of a sonic baseline to show how uh, even the same hymn in the same language can be sung in very different ways, uh, I thought I would uh, turn first to Kevin Lawrence, since we've started with some uh, music from the Greek archdiocese, and uh, uh, ask uh, Kevin uh, to tell us about some of his experience of the range of music that he's encountered in the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese, where he spent most of his career as a, as a church musician, um, and um, talk about a little bit how changes in musical style have related to uh, what he's seen and what he's done. Kevin. Thank you, delighted to be here. Um, I, I would start uh, for a moment just framing uh, things with a little bit of lofty talk. Uh, the public prayer of the church uses a vibrant religious culture to bring people together. So it fashions a sense of human connection that represents a deeper, deeper spiritual communion. And so we look for an experience that will raise us to the reality for which we are made, uh, but which we can only experience here and now in a limited fashion uh, and, and so on. But um, <laughs> when we think about the kind of musical styles that can support this, this noble endeavor, we can stay on this elevated and abstract uh, level. But uh, as I've worked as a church musician for so many years, I've been inclined to focus most of all on the needs and perspectives of the people involved. And uh, I, I know there's an American aphorism that all politics is local. And I would say in this context, all church music is local. Liturgical singing is always for somebody right there in the local community. 
and it's always created by someone in the local community. Um, we can send away to a fine iconographer from far off and they can mail us a beautiful icon. But um, the singing that happens on a regular basis in our churches has to come from people who are actually there. And so the ideals of liturgical singing that anyone might want to aspire to are going to be subject to the enthusiasms and the very real limitations of the particular singers who are available for the community. Um, when we think of singing as being for someone in the local community, um, to do this work of bringing people together, the singing requires some degree of consensus. Um, we have a received religious culture and we want to be faithful to it, but uh, this cultural inheritance is always going to be interpreted by particular people in a, a local situation. Um, I, I think of the experience I've seen of immigrants uh, in Greek parishes, first generation immigrants, uh, as I've seen from the outside, they have an interest in hearing the sounds of their faraway homeland and they're going to value very much the connection with their earlier oral experience. Second and third generation uh, groups might find in liturgical singing a badge of their ancestral identity, that badge word that, that you used before. Uh, and um, they can use this badge to contrast themselves uh, and their identity with the larger pluralistic society. So they may, may come to value especially the ways in which their church music differs from the music of the larger society. People who come to the Orthodox Church from outside historically Orthodox nations might find in this liturgical singing a richer experience of um, Christian worship than, than maybe the somewhat insipid and commercialized religious culture they encountered before. These people obviously won't be interested in an assimilationist approach. So um, I think of the famous dictum of Alexander Kostalski calling for liturgical music that can be heard nowhere except in church as distinct from secular music as church vestments are from the dress of the laity. But how far can we go with the kind of exoticism that this comment might suggest? Uh, as a musician, I've seen vividly that there is a practical limit to how different the music sung in church can be from the music that, that the singers experience in other areas of their life. Now, we're not talking about enjoying music uh, that's produced by somebody else, but again, these, you know, these are people who are making the music happen. Um, as people sing, um, they're going to hear and understand the music differently depending on what kind of music they grew up with and what they hear around them. So I think of the Greeks living in Vienna in Schubert's time, uh, who they were immersed in a sonic world very different from the world of the ecumenical patriarchate. Uh, they thought it would be a marvelous thing to, to make harmonizations of uh, the melodies that they heard in church. But this interest was not shared by the leadership of the patriarchate, uh, a group of clergy who we might expect uh, there was not a single person from the group who had ever heard any Schubert at all. Uh, well, someone can research this. I, I, I'm a mere violinist. I don't do this kind of work. So anyway, um, so we, we can't know for sure how music is being heard by others, but there are clues. And I'd like to suggest a couple of clues. And then, you know, when I'm getting to be talking too long, you have to let me know. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm very interested in indications that music originally conceived in a monophonic world is now likely to be heard by people who live in the kind of musical culture we share. Um, and I'm going to start outside our own communion. The, the music of the Syriac speaking churches is famous for being monophonic. I mean, not even an Eson. And yet, if you do any kind of listening to, you know, church services from Kerala, from India, from Iraq, from Syria, you will hear the, the, the whine of an electronic organ supporting people. Um, it's, it's stunning, really. And, and you can hear the same thing uh, from Armenian uh, churches. And not just, you know, little tiny parishes, but, you know, the enthronement of a bishop, for example, in the U.S., uh, in New York. You hear this sound. So that's interesting to me. It implies that... Um, you know, not, not just that the choirs can't handle it without the organ, but people kind of hear it this way. Um, 
an interesting example from closer to home, uh, Ted Bogdanos uh, in 1993 wrote a, a book for you know choir people with all the the um, variable elements of you know Sunday Divine Liturgies, and in the book with the melodies, uh, you're laughing because you know uh, there is uh, well what. Anna Gallus called guitar chords, uh, the expectation that there is some organist and maybe wouldn't know which chords to make. So the same kind of thing as the Armenians or the Syriac folks. Um, I would say um, closer to what would be considered the ideal, you have eson placement that becomes like a harmony. Uh, it's, like, it's like a bass line. Um, we'll talk about that more in detail. Um, but now I'd like to turn to uh, an example of a realized harmonization uh, from a group of people who are famous for doing this. And uh, this is the Carpathian folks. Uh, this is, this is uh, there are a couple of really wonderful examples and I came up with this one for a good reason, which I'll share later. Um, the Carpatho uh, Russian um, Archdiocese, this is a big gathering, outdoor, kind of casual recording done outdoors. Um, you can tell that these are, you know, these are the stalwarts of the Archdiocese and they knew what they were doing. And so um, why, don't we, why don't we hear them go to it? nothing quite like that sound. And uh, I, I must say, on a personal note, this is the first Eastern Christian uh, community prayer that I ever experienced. Uh, this is the way they sang. And it was kind of amazing. You look, you know, right next to you was some guy who looks like maybe he's a plumber or something. He's making up a bass line and everybody knows. I mean, they, they knew this to cure for Vespers. It's so impressive. Anyway, um, now the reason I thought this would be a particularly nice excerpt to hear, uh, at the Clergy Lady Congress of the Greek Archdiocese in 1996, um, I had the honor of going uh, to early morning liturgies that used a um, set of English melodies that I had done. And I was right there next to Taiki Zess, and we sang, you know, kind of led people, and they all sang along uh, in very much the same way we just heard. And particularly striking to me was when it came time to do a Trisagian service, they sang these very, you know, this, this same liturgical element. There was no music, there were no words. I mean, everybody just knew it. This was, a, a, again, a stalwart group of people from the Archdiocese who had gotten up rather early, you know, probably stayed up very late the night before. And they all sang uh, uh, in exactly this way with parallel thirds, uh, sort of improvised bass. And 
I, I mean, I don't know if I was perhaps the only person in the room who <laughs> made this connection with the Carpathians, but but to me, it does show at least in 1996 with this stalwart, perhaps old group, that that's the way people were hearing this music. So I'd like to just close by saying, you know, you can say, well, they shouldn't hear it that way. Uh, and maybe you're right, but there's something really wonderful about this level of ownership of the chant by the community. And I think whatever um, pastoral uh, value we place on the honoring the best of our liturgical heritage, uh, we have to pay some attention uh, to that great value that when people share this music in this way, they are brought together in a community of prayer, uh, which is the most important goal of all. So. No, that, that was a, a fantastic example, Kevin. Actually, since since you've got a musicologist as a narrator, I can't <laughs> help as doing uh, making a couple of comments. One is that, I mean, the, the the Ottoman late Ottoman world was very cosmopolitan, so you did have uh, uh, Western uh, music that was making its way very much into uh, the uh, the main cultural center. So, like the earliest publications of secular music in Byzantine notation have sections of of things of Western melodies, melos evropaikon, a section. So, and you even have Bellini and other things being written out in Byzantine nooms. So, so on the one hand, the, 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 there's some unexpected crossovers at times. In Vienna, you had also the Serbs and the Jews were doing the same thing, harmonizing their music at exactly the same time too. So there was there was something in in the air. But I would just say about the about this spontaneous harmonization, it that you can find it in a band, a, a, a geographic band going all the way across from the Ionian Islands, which were under the Venetians rather than the Ottomans, going through the border regions of the Austro-Hungarian Empire as well. And um, uh, so uh, the Banat region of Serbia and Romania, they do that type of spontaneous harmonization, and then it goes up into uh, Galicia and the sort of Carpathian areas as well. So, I mean, it's very much a historical fact and some of that made it way over to Holy Cross, the uh, the seminary, the Orthodox seminary, because some of the people were from the Ionian Islands, the the original intelligentsia and people who ran things. Just but and anyway, enough historical footnotes. But just a, one question then, bearing all this in mind, how have you implemented this these ideals yourself as a composer for the church? Um, there are a couple of values for me uh, that that I've tried to consider. One is simplicity. Um, when I when I think of the kind of people I've seen and, you know, in parishes and what kind of singing they could do, um, I've been really aware that, well, first of all, I, I mean, I have had the experience of, uh, you know, seeing Slavic parishes with without organ. I mean, the, the Greek American experience of using the organ uh, hasn't ever appealed to me. So between the desire to make things um, simple enough for people to really handle well and feel that confidence and comfort that, you know, the best liturgical singing uh, requires, and the idea that they can sing without accompaniment. Um, there's, there's a whole area of the music I've done that really is like this, you know, thirds, simple, simple bass line. Um, and then there's also, um, there's been some music that I've written that's a little more interesting, uh, that has, uh, you know, more dissonance and more, you know, it's a little bit more like art music. But I think I've almost always been reluctant to make um, musical choices that would cut off many people from uh, using the music and that would perhaps be uh, too ambitious for the choirs I've seen to handle successfully. So I, I guess I've really focused a lot on these people uh, that I just happen to have seen, if that makes sense. No, very much so. And actually, it's a wonderful segue to our uh, uh, next uh, panelist. I'd like to bring in, in Benedict Sheehan now, who um, has uh, 
worked also uh, extensively as a composer and uh, I'd like to sort of hear your perspectives on these uh, same issues, sort of the range and relative importance of the musical styles that you encounter in your church life and, um, and then eventually something also about uh, how you yourself have dealt with it as a composer. Yeah, sure, I'd be glad to. Um, it's great to be here. It's, it's nice to, to be on this and thank you for doing it. Um, so, and also uh, I'll explain to, to, our, to our audience, I, as I do before I start to, to talk a lot, I do have a, st a, st a, st a, I do have a, st a stutter when I speak, in particular when I say the word stutter. <laughs> uh, and uh, I do explain to people that it's purely an affectation in order to get people to pay attention. To, 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 to pay attention to, to, to me, um, it, but it actually it's not. I, that's just a j j j j j j j j joke. Um, so anyway, bear with me. Uh, I don't have any control over it. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I grew up in the, in the in, I, I grew up in, in parishes of the Orthodox Church in America of the OC, of the OCA, um, which is primarily has music of the Slavic background. Uh, I would say a good a good part of it is is, uh, or at least in it, 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 depending on what part of the country you're in, um, a good part. Of the kind of musical, the musical background of parishes of the OCA is of the kind of music that we just heard from from that we that we just heard in the example from Gavin. Um, that that is a lot of what uh, of what the uh, of the people that. That be, that that started the first that started the first parishes of the OCA. That's a lot of the kind of singing that they did, um, and you can still find many parishes in which that is the, the norm. I would say over the course of the twentieth century, there was an evolution. Um, uh, there there are perhaps some parishes were eager to sound more like a like a like a like a, like a cathedral in St. Petersburg or, 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 or Moscow. You had um, the, the musical influence of the European emigrant of the European emigrant and then some of that as it worked its way out into the church through St. Vladimir's Seminary. Um, and in recent years with the work of the eminent Dave Drellick. Um, one of the things I've, I've realized as I've been a church, a church musician for, I don't know, for 25 years at this point, um, is that uh, a great deal depends on on what books you've got in church? Um, it it it's it's very interesting that a musical tradition can evolve, it can grow, it can ch change, and then some somebody produces an an anthology or an influential um, book. And it kind of codifies it, at least for a for for a period of time. At least for for a period of time. Um, so, for, for 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 instance, a lot of a lot of the parishes of the OCCA still sing from the Blue Book, the as it's called. It's the Divine Liturgy book published by Father Father Igor Saroka, I think. Um, and it was the first really widespread anthology of 
church music for the OCA in the in the English in the English language, um, and be, because it was done pretty early and done quite well for its time, uh, it became the norm. Um, and then in the eighties, uh, the Saint the 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 Saint Vladimir's uh, the, the Saint Vladimir's Green Book, right? It's all which which co color you choose. Um, that that became the norm, at least in some parishes. I believe that was nineteen eighty two or eighty three. Um, and so I come from from a, from a number of parishes. Uh, I grew up in New England um, that sang from the Green Book, or were in a process of a change from the Blue Book to the Green Book, if you know what I mean. Um, uh, so that that's kind of that's what and what's interesting about these anthologies is is they is they put on the page um, a, a thing that that is always in a process of evolution. It's always in a process of change. Uh, a book gives us the the illusion that things have always been that way. Um, and and they also give the illusion that somehow these things have the stamp of approval of the church in some very official capacity. Um, I, I've 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 been in circumstances where I was a choir director in a parish. And I introduced a new piece of mu 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 music, or I changed the wrong thing, um, and I was confronted by somebody who was upset and said, "You know, did you know? I don't. You know, was this approved by the church?" And I was like, "Well, who would approve it?" And there's like, "Isn't there some kind of a? Isn't there some kind of a pan pan panel or committee that that says what you can sing in church and what you can't?" And I'm like, "If." There, 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 there is. I've never met them. Um, I mean, so these things do exist. These things, I guess, do exist, or maybe nominally exist, and they have, have existed in the past. Um, but they've never really achieved uh, anything like standard, standardizing music, even in a you know a smaller regional church, let alone the whole church. So um, I, 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 I think uh, one of the things I've come to accept as a church musician is that there is no final answer to what should we sing in church, what music is correct, what music is orthodox. Um, it's a thing that has been in a continual pro process of evolution, and it is evolving in quite interesting and new ways now that we find it in the new world, now that we, in particular, find it in the, in the, English, in the English language, now that the church is quite multi is quite multicultural, and I hope will become more so. Um, uh, so, I, I, as a young musician, I thought there must be there must be an answer. There there, there must be a a true interpretation of of what what makes music orthodox or what what makes music right for church, and the. the best I can say is having been through what I've been through that I realized that there's there really isn't a right answer there's not a complete answer at least um, well how about the answers that you yourself have come up with as a composer because I know you've been on worked on various ends of the spectrum from your liturgy book uh, which is largely chant based and 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 so right. on to um, uh, to your liturgy that was recently premiered and recorded for, for a very uh, yeah. accomplished chorus. Yeah, right. Well, right. So it, I, I'm glad you bring that up. It, I, so I kind of, 
I simultaneously tried to work at at both ends of a continuum, if you know what I mean. Um, you know, we there, there 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 is a broad continuum, and I think it's very important what Kevin said about just you, you know, as spiritual musicians, we are having to deal with concrete with the with really concrete realities of who who you've got to sing, what can they sing, what do they want to sing. Um, what what do they what do they expect church to sound sound like, um, and uh, and 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 for the mo mo for the mo most part the actual kind of musical technical standards that you find you know m m many Orthodox churches in this in this in the country are kind of at the bottom end um, in terms of like we we don't have we don't tend to have highly trained buyers on um, across the board we often don't even tend to have highly trained choir to require conductors, musicians are for the most part not paid to do what they do. Um, uh, so you have to deal with really concrete kind of like, oh, can, can this even be sung? Um, and and so we 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 so I've I've had to confront the issue of. Uh, is the music that we've got in the in, 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 in our books? Is it even is it even is it even singable by a church buyer by a by a given church buyer? Um, so. Uh, in order to kind of try to address some of that, in 2016, I put I worked to put together a book of mainly Slavic chants for the liturgy, all on one staff, all all based on 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 quite straightforward chant melodies. That were intended to be harmonized. I included a very rudimentary bass part and 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 then implied parallel th th third, um, and so 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 that is kind of the everyday thing. And and I've I've heard from a lot of people that it's a very helpful resource. Um, if you're used to singing in four parts and seeing four parts, it, it can be a little difficult because there's, you know, you don't, not, not every part is in there. Um, but it allows for, it, it allows the music to be adapted to a different, to, to, to a whole range of needs. So, and, and we just uh, put, put out a book for Vespers as well, as, uh, just, just, just uh, last year in, on, in, in, in the same dial. So then at the other end, I, my thought is, well, we can do this kind of everyday stuff all the time, um, but if we don't know why we sing and why we have music in church to begin with, you know, and what, what is what is the thing that 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 we're aiming for? Um, you kind of run out of steam, I think. I mean, I, I certainly know that I do as an artist that if that, that if I only did four part harmonizations or two part harmonizations of music that that moves entirely by by by, by step. Uh, then I'm gonna, you know, then we're gonna, then we're gonna run, 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 run out of energy. So um, part of part of this is that I also kind of compose at the other end to kind of give us an idea of what we're aspiring to as musicians in the in the in the in the church. Um, 
I know you've got a music example for us, but I wonder if maybe we can hold that for a sure. little bit. Yeah, let's hold off on that. Because we're, because we're going to talk also about this question of Americanization and culturation. And so I think on it would fit there. Yes. Uh, so yeah. I, what, I, what I'd, I'd like to do now is then um, turn to Dorothy Berry, who um, to, to give us some other perspectives. I think one of the voices that has really been lacking in discussions of Orthodox church music has been precisely that of uh, ethnomusicology, the kind of more social science oriented uh, end of, music, of, of academic musical study. Uh, why do people do things? Why do they say they do things? How, uh, you know, what are the belief systems around them as opposed to uh, treating everything as if it's biblical criticism and we can find the one true chant out there, uh, you know, some with, with the, the ur text of when think people were truly pious. So um, uh, Dorothy, please uh, if, uh, tell us more about your experience of uh, music in the Orthodox Church and, and, and um, what um, the sort of things that you see about the use of different musical styles and, and what people think about them or what you think about them. Great. Well, I think that um, Kevin's earliest point about sort of the localness of church singing is so key both in looking at Orthodox church music from an ethnomusicological standpoint or from any standpoint, because I've been to so many churches across the country, different dioceses, and I have never heard the same music. Sometimes I've heard the same melody, I think, and then as I'm singing along, they actually do it differently. <laughs> or, oh, this translate, I know all these words, but a slightly different, and to the extent that sometimes it's, it can be very distracting. At my local church, which is in the Antiochian Archdiocese, they do some Slavic melodies, but they do not do them in the rhythms that I am familiar with them being done. <laughs> And I, I want to say, you guys, are, you're doing it wrong. This isn't how it goes. Or, you know, certain arrangements even where I associate that particular setting of that tone with Good Friday, but you sing it with the communion hymn, which now makes me think that this communion hymn is very sad. <laughs> but that's not, a, none of them have that connection because they don't sing that on Good Friday. And I think that that sort of localness tied with the very strong both immigrant and convert desire that can exist in orthodoxy for rightness um, and not necessarily a rightness that is elevated at all times, but sometimes a rightness that comes for us from, you know, a rich sense of pride of being correct. And I think that that can come from the nostalgia, the uh, not nostalgia, but sort of the nationalistic urgings of being immigration, coming to new countries, wanting to establish that the things that you have inherited are correct. And a lot of convert experience of finding a true faith and then saying that what they learned at this original point is the right thing. And then for all we know, the right thing you learned was a church with organs, which some people hate and some people love. So I think that that is a really interesting experience on the person level. And I think back to when I was in graduate school, I did in Bloomington, Indiana, I did field work at the local Orthodox church, focusing on the experience of young people, college students, who are coming from different big cities, different jurisdictions, and are now in a small college town where there is one Orthodox church. So if you are any sort of kid that's going to go to church, you'll go there regardless of your musical tradition. And thinking of how important music is, because I mean, when I think of non-Orthodox friends who have listened into Zoomed services over this course year, past year that I participated in, sometimes they'll say, that was a nice concert. Because they don't, because the whole service is sung to them, so that must be a concert, or they're missing the um, the structure that you would associate with um, like Protestant worship. And I think that that idea of how important the music is and this connection to rightness can be so detrimental because there were some young people who were didn't even go didn't go to church that often, not because of a lack of piety. Well, that's argument. So somebody else can make that argument. Not because of a lack of piety, but because it didn't sound like church to them. It was not what they associate church with, which was, I think, in those cases, um, more plain chant. And that church did more harmonized music. It just didn't sound like what Orthodox church is. And I think that that is, on a spiritual level, a type of rightness and right desire for correctness that we've seen at various levels can be a hindrance to longevity in the church, especially with conversion. And it's thinking of the complexity of the music as well. 
um, in America, which has had a rich tradition of simplifying church music. American church music, you know, took the West Gallery music from England and from the nonconformist churches and simplified it so much so as you don't have to read music, you can just read shapes or with the lined out hymnody, uh, you know, coming from Gallic psalm singing. Someone will just read this line and then we can just sing it to the next line. These are some of our strongest American, um, like organic American musical traditions. And I think that that carries in a lot with people's church experience as well. I think that um, thinking of harmonization, which has come up a lot, I think about how I've heard at memorial services in churches that do Byzantine chant, I hear people harmonizing it to end on a major key because it's too sad if you end it on the minor key. I've heard those back and forth ideas of emotion that we connect with music and composition that are totally foreign from both the Slavic music and the Byzantine music because those are very Western European ideas of sad and happy with sound and how often they carry it. I've had Greeks tell me that the Russian music is too sad. I've had Russians tell me the Greek music is too sad. It's all, I mean, what is sadness? I don't know, maybe it's supposed to be sad, but this sort of ideas carry in and we don't have a place for them because we kind of want to act like Americanization doesn't happen or if it does happen, it's just a thing we know is bad. But then we don't have these good discussions about complex music and its place in our churches is, our, is church a place for musical exploration? If it is a place for musical exploration, who is that for? Going back to this earlier discussion, when we think of the people, is there, you know, this sort of spiritual dy dynamics that exist where congregational singing is participatory, but if the music becomes too complicated, does the congregation become listeners? Which then maybe is okay? Like there's all these sorts of, um, spiritual theorizations that are key to understanding the complexity of music, but I often think, especially about converts in America, the sort of idea that can come along with, you have to be really, really smart to convert to orthodoxy because there's so many books you have to read. And if that's true, then I guess it's not the true faith because like an illiterate person can find God. But we kind of bring the same thing with the music and thinking, if it's too simple, maybe this isn't really orthodox, but at that point we have one person who can do the services. And if we have one person who can do the services and he doesn't show up, and for some reason it's a he always, we have problems. And I think that it is an interesting thing to me to see how um, composers and churches, how composers attempt to and work towards Americanization and how mission churches, especially that I've over time, create an Americanization based on the organic singing practice. And I think that that sort of organic practice is, I'm sure if someone was doing a truly deep field study across the country, we would discover some very interesting sonic happenings because so much of American music in particular and American church music is local and is cultural to regions. I, this has come up quite often in my experience um, where a common thing I have been asked by Orthodox church musicians and composers is, do I think that if they composed a liturgy setting or a set of tones that sounded like African-American Christian music that that would welcome black people into the church? Which is a distinct misunderstanding of African-American musical practice in the church because I can't write for you to feel free with a rhythm. And I can't the same, well, the closest thing would almost be if I was giving you Byzantine notation and telling you to feel this out. <laughs> And that was um, one of my mom's favorite stories of, to embarrass me as a child. Um, well, as a priest child, you can always embarrass your children, it's your right. Um, was that we used to listen to lots of gospel music and gospel quartet music in the car and stuff like that. And I would, when I was very little, would get in trouble at church with my mom because I would be singing, uh, what would that be? Like the first antiphon in the Kievian tone, but with like a swing. I would just sing it with a melody that I thought was how you would sing if you were feeling church music. And she said, that's not, it doesn't go. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, bless it at that. That's not how it goes. But I feel that was written down and it was given to the people. Then it also becomes equally as arbitrary, right? And I think that that's, again, these great points that Benedict and Kevin brought up 
writing it down makes it a solid thing, which is so different than what you hear. And even with things that are thinking of American music styles that are famous for their rigidity in terms of vernacular church music, you know, um, shape note music is famous for its rigidity in the sense of not wanting, uh, it is sort of against practice to do improvisatory work is a thing that we say now when we look at those books. <laughs> But if you listen to from the 1950s, perhaps um, like a old primitive Baptist convention recordings, they are not keeping to the books. And even to escalate on that, there's also a rich African American shape note tradition from the deeper South, on which again, we are keeping to these melodies and yet, and that's always that sort of thing that is an interesting, um, it's always interesting to see the ways that we both try to fit Orthodox church music into Americanization, and for that matter, try to fit our Byzantine music in. I think anyone who's saying Byzantine music in a church that's not in Byzantine notation has seen the wackiest incidentals and key signatures in the world, because we can't just say, it's actually not a B sharp, it's like, it's like in between. And as someone, else, okay, I guess I can close with that from my experience, as someone who comes from the new music world, and is very comfortable with being told, just having like a squiggly line meaning about that note or being told, you know, having some strange, um, you know, Milton Babbitt's having a great time writing all these notes for you. I get that, but this, the world of confusion is so deep with all this incidentals and making it seem harder than if we were to really want to go pull back away from this professionalism and say, how do you learn this music? We need to sing it together and you need to listen to me. <laughs> you maybe don't learn it, from looking at something that now looks like only, you know, a virtuoso can learn to do it. Such as you bring up so many issues. I just sort of think of one uh, European Research Council grant after another <laughs> for initiatives to, to study these things or NEH grants on, on, on your side of the Atlantic. Um, and, uh, yeah, you bring up so many, I mean, the, the, precisely the, the issue what you were saying about that you were singing the first antiphon though. I mean, a version of that is kind of what happened with that, that uh, Tropon of the Cross in Los Angeles, that uh, the, the original way that it would be sung in the Middle East became socially unacceptable or it wasn't what chant was conceived of uh, in those circumstances. And, and, and then also try to get um, a group of Anglicans to try to do a Russian style of recitation uh, as well, of, of choral recitation. It's, as Benedict, we're all nodding our heads. It's, it's like pulling teeth. So the, 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 or, the importance of community standards, oral traditions. What I'd like, I, because uh, uh, we've opened up so many issues that could again be each be the subject of their own panel. I just wanna go, maybe if we can go for about another 15 minutes of, of talking among ourselves before we open it up for some, some questions. And Dorothy, one of the things that you brought up though, and, and it's come up off and on before though, was about the right way. I mean, that, and there's, there is this strong alliance between uh, orthodoxy and orthopraxy of various sorts. Um, and one of the real questions is to what extent is music included in that rubric of orthopraxy is and and how specific do you get? So I just if everyone could maybe uh, offer some of their perspectives on in your experience, you know, are, are more are there some uh, styles that in your experience have been more seen as more as as emblems of orthopraxy than others? Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll start with that if 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 if, if, if it's okay. Um, I mean, we there there are certainly there 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 are certainly streams of mu music in the ch church that have become do do dominant. Um, I, I think it's not accidental that these are also streams that have dominated the sphere of politics in the past. You know, we, we speak about Byzantine music and, and Russian music and outside of Orthodoxy, we speak of, you know, Anglican church music or Gregorian chant. You know, these were, these are the practices of, 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 these are the practices of M, of M, of M, of M, 
empires in the sphere of politics. I mean, so they they are the dominant streams because they dominated everything. Um, I, I mean, it's not that's not all there is to to, to this story, but I think it's an important part of this story. Um, it, so now in America, we don't have any empire. We 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 don't have any empire at, at at least not one that dominates the church or the sphere of the church. So it's no it's no accident. Therefore, that we're that we're asking like which one do we do? What's the right thing? Because we don't have it being told us. Um, yeah. I'd love to chime in with a, a thought that I've had for a good while now. Um, and Benedict, this might be something you have uh, thought about a lot. Um, the Carpathian Prostopinia, um, when the, the Byzantine Catholics uh, entered the Russian jurisdiction, uh, their homegrown kind of down-home chant was basically suppressed. And they looked, well, you can say it's the empire, but th th uh, this is more like what Dorothy's saying. This was better. You know, the, the Obikot is better. And and so they lost something. And uh, I, I mean, I'm going to go ahead and get myself in trouble by saying this. I really see a possible, a similar kind of development um, in what happens in the Greek archdiocese where people say, Ah, oh, this chant is better. That other stuff that you all grew up with. Oh, if only you knew. Uh, we're agree. going to give you something that's that's much nicer. And then then a whole you know a whole world of connection with the services is lost for people. So it's not maybe just empire, but there's a connection with a mythical faraway land where exactly. everything's better. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that these are all really great points. And I think, you know, there's such a connection to these sorts of material things, like going to Benedict's point about, so people sort of feeling in a sense rudderless because there's not a direct, you know, there is not a Pope who is telling them directly this hierarchy of handing down, although great amount of hierarchy of course exists. But thinking of the ways in which we see that with music and the way we see that with all sorts of sort of material um, accompaniment to orthodoxy and putting, and then how that is retroactively put onto the tradition of millennia. This idea of if you're Orthodox Christian, you have like 20 icons in your house. Then you have a big icon room, maybe, or at least a corner that has a lampada. And because that's what all Orthodox Christians have, which of course makes no, I mean, reproduction of images is very recent. <laughs> Art in the age of mechanical reproduction is not something that had for most of the time of Orthodoxy. And if it did, most peasant type people did not afford to have many paintings on the wall as well as Lampada. And I feel like sometimes that comes as well with this idea of what is Orthodox music? It is something that is only done by expert people and is very complex. Whatever type of complex that is, either the most gorgeous Russian choir that is has the highest highs and those very low, lowest lows, or it is the sort of mellifluous chant that one needs to dedicate their life to and also have the circumstance of being born with a beautiful voice. That is the best case scenario, which leads to that dangerous point of, and if it's not those things, then it's not what we have in the church. If you're not the most beautiful chanter, you can't chant at all. And I think often this sort of idea, we're going back thinking of like Kevin getting the St. Romanus Award, if we only let the most excellent chanters chant, then we wouldn't even have him as a saint, would we? His whole story, of course, of being, he was so terrible at chanting that he falls asleep because of the shame. You know, they keep making him, but he's so terrible at chant. And the sort of thing of how are we, how, I, I guess that's always my thought of how the congregation in some ways can feel alienated from the liturgy, which is entirely being chanted when it's in styles and ways that it's now just become, wow, that was a really beautiful, that's a beautiful thing they did. And I'm here because this is what I do. But this is a beautiful thing other people did, which I guess is the vote for, towards the simplicity. But even that, it just, there's so much tradition that we get, especially if people convert, but anyone who's done some sort of catechism, so many things that you get taught are the way things are in the Orthodox church. And very rarely do people use the sort of, you know, 
autoethnographic language of saying, this is the way things are in the Orthodox Church if you're in this jurisdiction at this time and you're in this region and also in our home church. That's the right way to explain it, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, but I mean, I, 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 what you're saying, I think, is that's why I feel it's very important to be working at, at both ends of the continuum. Um, you know, I mean, I, I kind of see musical culture as, as wealth in, in a certain way. And we, we know from economics that if you just basically give everybody exactly the same th 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 same th 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 thing, then you're going to run out. Basically, it becomes a zero sum game, and we kind of run, we, we kind of run out of resources. But if you only give everything to the, to the, to the aristocracy, to the elites, then we all kind of are, we, we all kind of wallow in misery and poverty. So you you have my 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 view is you have to both be investing at the upper end of the artistic spectrum and at the other and and, and at the bottom end simultaneously, and yeah. that's how you'll get an enriched musical uh, musical culture. I think in the Greek archdiocese, uh, there's been something along this line that people have uh, worked toward with the choir conference idea, uh, get, getting, you know, literally a couple hundred people together and singing, you know, well, like Desby, uh, music that virtually nobody could sing in their home parish. And people love that. The, uh, what I saw, you know, for, for when I first encountered all this was that people would try to bring that uh, music into their tiny uh, parish situation and uh, you know it wouldn't work so um but what i think uh, the question that everyone's touching on um is how do we look for something that's better than what we see and how do we get people there um without denigrating the you know fantastic variety of experiences that 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 people have um and and that that's very tricky i think um <laughs> Well, you might say that if we consider how much we object to what others do, uh, how much we decide, you know, is inferior versus if, you know, another approach is to present something that we simply think is better, uh, then we might, we might offer more options in a, in a more loving spirit. Um, you know, there's, there's a guy named George Anastasiu uh, he's not my hero, but he was, you know, he's proud of himself for introducing the uh, electronic organ to the Greek Americans. And uh, he did harmonizations of Socrates. I mean, just, just nobody likes these people these days. And, you know, I'm not impressed myself, but, but he wrote something that's very wise. He says, as for those who may be my criticizers, and those of posterity, let them present better things. <laughs> so I, I think that's a nice uh, word from somebody that we might not tend to look up to all that much. Just if I, I might just add a couple of observations, just to sort of take this into a kind of more transnational uh, discourse, because certainly the, what's happening with Byzantine chant and its revival around the world really is a, 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 a transnational phenomenon. I mean, there was certainly the, the examples of empire and suppression. I mean, there was the, in the past, the, the Georgian church had its music largely suppressed in the in the late Russian Empire, and it's sort of now coming back. But but I was thinking too about this notion of of, of orthodoxy and orthopraxy because one of the things with Byzantine chant is that it does have a notated tradition, the central tradition that goes back a thousand years. Um, and, and certainly on its various geographic peripheries, it has been simplified at various times. Um, uh, and right now there's a big debate going on in some parts of the church in Serbia, for example, over their uh, indigenized version of the chant, the Poyanje, uh, versus uh, reinstituting full-fledged central tradition Byzantine chant. And there are musicologists and my colleagues who've, who've worked on that subject and, and those debates 
uh, and and just how um, incensed some people are that there's a monastery in the north of Serbia, Kovi, that does all Byzantine chant services, and that's so far north they never did that type of music there. But you know, where do they get off doing singing that? And on the other hand, the the monks of Kovi are are great apostles for Byzantine chant as a kind of the great central tradition, and that's why there's a school of Byzantine music in Moscow as, as well. So I think on the one hand, there's a, and St. Petersburg as well. And I've chanted services in, in Moscow in Byzantine chant. You can go every day of the week and hear a service in Byzantine chant in Moscow now. Um, but, but what I was thinking more about then, if, if that's a kind of view of perhaps, of the, the, it might even say the philological view that, that music is like the liturgical texts themselves, or even more like biblical or patristic texts, that it's some kind of they've come down from the past, and what we're trying to do is just maintain that that closed system. To what extent is it open? Because certainly we've all talked about change, adaptation, um, and and Americanization. And maybe the Benedict, I thought this might be a good example for you to to introduce your. Uh, and we're also talking about the high end of the spectrum, artistically, quote unquote, uh, so something <laughs> from your uh, liturgy. Yeah, sure. I'd be glad to. Yeah, I'd love to play the the Holy God from my liturgy, which I'll say was was not composed for a church choir. It was a comm commission by the Patram Institute. Um, so I don't present this as the music that we all should be trying to sing in church, um, but m m more as an idea of um, creating a sound world, um, you know, large, large scale pieces of music and by extension, large works of any kind um, are, are important in that they have the capacity to influence other work and, um, I believe it's uh, Jordan P P P P P P P Peterson who makes the point that uh, that that what we define as a as a canon in terms of art is the, is those is those works that have the most influence on other works. Um, so I wrote a, 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 a liturgy very much under the influence of composers like Rachmaninoff or Tchaikovsky, um, but also under the influence of, of composers like Von Williams and William Billings and Palestrina and 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 Arvo Parrot. So. Um, we, we, I, I, I feel like we need these kinds of things in order to give us a sense of, well, my, my goal was to try to create a sound world that we could say, ah, that's orthodox. And it's also uh, of, of this time and of this place. So um, at least uh, I'm trying. <laughs> Well, let, let's let's hear that now then.
I, I, I think you're still on mute, Alex. See, you've left me speechless. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, no, so, so very beautiful. Um, gosh, again, this is such a, a rich topic. Um, I'm just wondering if, is, if, are there any sort of, uh, sort of quick closing thoughts that uh, anyone has before we open it up for, for uh, there are a couple of questions that are, have, have come in. Um, and uh, we don't want to, I think we do want to, to uh, finish pretty much at the half hour point here. So any, any other sort of thoughts or? I just had a quick example that came to mind thinking of Benedict's last beautiful composition, but also the last points that sort of has, a, for me is always was a striking example of completely modern art setting that I would not want to attempt to do in church, but that clearly pulls from the tradition. And that's the, the uh, Maximilian Steinberg Passion Week Noble Joseph setting, which is, I mean, that is the melody that you sing in church. And I grew up singing that in church. I don't think I ever saw the music for that. Like, I don't think I've ever seen the music. I'm sure we have it somewhere, but that melody, but then you could hear it in this very, you know, early 20th century modernist spaced out arrangement, but it's still clearly that music. And I think that that is something that is the benefit compositionally of having such a rich tradition that you could pull compositionally from Orthodox music and produce almost anything, but still be able to pull, pull back those motifs. You know, the it is one of the richest vocabularies available to us, but that's a very edgy type of composition to really go there. It takes a lot of knowledge as well. You, you raise actually also another wonderful topic for discussion, which is the, um, and this is something that's been discussed more widely by uh, 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 a friend and colleague here, Jonathan Arnold, and who's an Anglican priest, used to sing with the uh, 16, has uh, wrote a, a book on this, on the use of, of sacred music, liturgical music that now has sort of come out into the, the concert halls and other life. And, and there's, that's something that's very much part of the modern Orthodox witness to the world, especially the music of somebody like Arvo Pert, who never actually sets uh, things for Orthodox liturgical purposes. If he, he sets Orthodox texts, they're always the things that are from the private prayer rules, uh, but but they're meant, meant to be done for the in 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 massive concert settings sometimes. So um, yeah, there's this this wider issue of of connecting with the wider culture and and the, the so the spectrum not only within the church of the from the simple to the to the elaborate but also then how one witnesses more widely to the to the world um kevin did you have, have something yeah, yeah if i could jump in to say benedict that's that's just so beautiful and i really appreciate in a way the simplicity of this this is not you know uh, for the little parish choir but i can imagine many parish choirs that could do well with it and maybe because of the organic quality of, I mean, using that motive, you know, in different, uh, you know, eighth notes, quarter notes, I mean, there, there's um, a sense of wholeness that we get that uh, I think that's a very important um, technique that co a composer can use. With a new motive, it doesn't matter. It, it still has an ageless uh, quality to it. So anyway, I sort of rambling, but I did want to thank you for this. Let's let's go now to some of the questions. We've got one, one question here. Can you recommend strategies to help the community feel like it's okay to engage with the musical tradition and own it? Uh, for instance, that it's okay to sing in the congregation, in our case it is, or to feel confident enough to stand with the choir? So how to promote that sense of community cohesiveness, if I'm understanding the question. I think I can address that as one of the only ones who's never been a professional church musician on this call, but has always ended up doing some types of singing. And I think a lot of it is one of the big ones, I think, for getting congregations comfortable is doing the same music. Yes. A lot of play, if you're going to change up the music, you know, if you're doing a different cherubic hymn, beautiful though they may be, if you've got 10 different ones that you do, and some of them are very, very complicated, people won't do them. And I know that some com composers think of that and sort of are setting those simple settings with the goal that we'll be able to sing along. But I think that that is a big 
component of people being able to sing along is to make the music sing alongable. That is, they have heard it before and they can it. At least for certain portions of the liturgy, things that are clearly popular, like responses, Lord have mercy, may be true, but Kim, that belongs to the specialists, but yeah, well, my, my, as you know, my some of you know in this panel, yeah. my historical work on the right of Hagia Sophia and the old and the old urban liturgy of, of, of late antiquity is very much there was this kind of division of labor. But I also I'm reminded right. that Father Bob Taft used to say about um, you know that that the complexity you know com complexity in liturgy oftentimes is a sign of monastic liturgy, and certain because you've got specialists who are there and they want variety, and and it's 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 true in such. That's the that's yeah. true no i i i sing and conduct and work at a mon mon monastery where there's where there's church two times a day every single day for the last 120 years and and so if you do the same thing all the time they're just going to go insane and so you, ha you have to change it. <laughs> um so yeah but what i would say to add to that is that um i, I think something really important is to get give people contexts in which they can sing together outside of church also um if the only if the only time you ever sing with other people is in church you're just you're not going to grow that much um and and you're there there will be it's kind of a one-sided approach to music because because we 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 tend to think of these great congregate these great congregate these great congregational singing traditions, and they are a wonderful thing. Um, but almost all, all of those people would have sung in other places too. Too, they would sing at home. They would sing as they worked. They would sing at the pub, you know. I mean, so if we only ever sing in church, we're just not going to sing that much. Um, and I think that's a big part of what we're seeing. We're seeing now. I mean, I, I see the singing of the congregation as a sign of musical wealth. It's a it's a it's it's a fruit, but if you don't pay attention to, you know, to, to kind of trying to take care of the tree and making sure it has water and is a strong, you know, I don't I, I don't want to go too too deep into this metaphor, but um, you know, but he's like, oh, I want the fruit 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 of fruit, fruit fruit of that, but you're not going to get a fruit, um. So that's what I would say is that if you really want people to sing in church, make them, have them sing outside of church too. And then they'll just want to sing. So I've got one question here. I think it's probably our last question. So do you feel, uh, and, and I think you probably wouldn't mind my saying who it is. It's our, our, our friend and eminent colleague, uh, Dr. Vladimir Morazan. Do you feel that there is any merit in attempting to deliberately integrate or blend the various national traditions in America? as a type of model that could be adopted or emulated by parishes throughout the English speaking Orthodox world. I hope so. And I think that at least in American churches that I've been to, people might not identify that as a like an active practice that they're doing, but that type of syncretization that happens because of the mixture of people is that that is already what's happening on the ground. And I think you know, we just had Pasca. Yes. And if you, any American church I've ever been to, we're doing like eight different settings of the Paschal Troparian, just in case someone from Moldova is here. 100%, yeah. <laughs> We've never met them, but if they come, we want them to know. Sometimes in the the Greek church I went to, we did a Romanian setting of the Paschal Troparian, and there was a Romanian family, and everyone was like, aren't you excited to hear this? And they said, we've never heard this before in our lives. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's so many regions of Romania with different chat traditions. <laughs> you know, doing that sort of Slavic setting of the antiphons we're doing, but now we're doing the, you know, the movable hymns are a Byzantine chant we're doing, but then true became we want to do Slavic and big with four part. I think that that is what happens. I think 
Yes. That, that a lot of work, I think trying to do things like that more consciously is rarely as successful as doing it based on the circumstance. Um, you know, thinking of, there's, a, there's been in America always, not always, but a long time since Dvorak, at least this idea that we can compose a new music that has all of the people in it because that is what America is. And even from that classic example of Symphony for the New World, the immediate response is Amy Beach becomes a white super nationalist. So it so doesn't know <laughs> she wrote in her letters that that was not her culture. Yeah, this is a fact. But that sort of thing can happen. But what's really great is that on the ground, you know, every church I've been to, even ones where it's, they, they want to do something, if they want to do something different, they might just pull this in. The Greek church I went to in Minneapolis is a giant Greek church with big choir. And all of a sudden, someone had this new Trisagion that was Slavic. And isn't this, in, it's very different than the things we do. And it was, everyone's so jazzed on it. I think that that is a very American way to be. Yeah. I have to say, um, I think that's a great goal. And I've seen it many places. And I've also had the experience of being told, this is our music, and that's it. And you don't bring this other stuff here. Because we want, you know, there is... Um, a goal among many people in keeping their religious culture intact. And it really does work directly you know, against uh, what Vlad is suggesting. Um, and I think, I, I mean, I, I've come to the point where I can accept that, um, that these two goals are you know, opposed. And some places will go with one and some places with the other. Um, and, and we do need to acknowledge I mean, there are plenty of parishes where you'll sing Christ is risen one way. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, to Kevin's point, I don't want to sound Pollyanna-ish. I have been told, and so has every, my family, have you heard that there are Ethiopian churches? Like, there are plenty of churches that just don't want people, period. <laughs> that aren't already, the, you know, that's a, that is a separate conversation. Yeah. But I think that when I think of like a very American congregation, I'm thinking of a place where we're, in my experience of those, we're doing a lot of different types of music. Yeah. Maybe not uh, all yes. of them, but we're trying. No, I completely agree. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's, that is what is, that is what is occurring on the ground. And even if we didn't, even if we thought this was a bad thing and shouldn't occur, you wouldn't be able to stop it. it it's happening. Um, and I would say that, that one of the things I tell my, 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 my students is that if you have the idea that you want to restore some imaginary past, like pure tradition, just keep in mind that that's a new idea, that you that that will be a modern phenomenon. It's occurred many times in the past where people have tried to restore a thing and they and they created a new thing. That's what that's what you will do. Um, so it's not it's not a it's not a, a, a process that we have control over. And but but I but I would say to Vlad's point that I do try to to consciously create combinations of things um, and and blend things to, to get, get, get together and bring some things in, some sounds in that, that are from some where else. I think that's a thing that can be done. I think it's a thing that should be done by, by composers and by musicians. Um, but I would say the, the, the boundaries of that are, is that it has to sound like church to the people that go to that church, um, if you're going to use it in church. And so, uh, but that's not a fixed point, right? Like, and and if it d d d d doesn't sound like church to the p p people that go to that church, church today, it, it, it that in 10 years, that's gonna be different. So, um, that that's what I would say the parameters are, but if we, as long as we're as long as we're aware of those boundaries and sensitive to those boundaries, but also trying to be aware of what people do actually want to hear in church and what 
is an aid to, 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 to them spiritually, we're going to create some really interesting and beautiful, beautiful art. I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm optimistic. Well, it's, it's good to end on an optimistic uh, uh, point. And actually, one thing just to, to note too, um, this this line of questioning uh, reminds me that that. One composer who tried to do it all by himself for about a, a, a decade was John Taverner. He his works for the Orthodox, actual Orthodox worship, and there are only three of them, but he did try to create such a, a synthesis. And then he found that the Greeks weren't interested in it. They were the only, and, the, and, and neither were the, were the Russians. They wanted to keep singing their own music. So he went and kept writing music for the Anglicans and the Roman Catholics. But um, uh, be that as it as it may, uh, the thank you all for a, a fascinating discussion. Again, this is, I see this very much as the beginning of a conversation to try to talk about some of these issues uh, in ways perhaps that they haven't been approached in, in the past and uh, within an American, but also within a, a global context. So thank you very much to each of our panelists and a big thanks also to our uh, sponsoring uh, organizations. Uh, of course, I wear the hat of being with Capella Romana, but es especially our friends at the uh, Fordham Center for uh, Orthodox Studies that um, I'm so grateful to them for having uh, broken sort of new ground with this in the, in the musical world. Uh, just to note and invite everyone, uh, as it was put in the chat, please to please visit their website uh, for all sorts of other things that they put up there www.fordham.edu slash orthodoxy and to note that this webinar will also be posted on uh, their YouTube channel so and there'll be announcements going out about that from Fordham and from Capella Roman as well so thank you all for a wonderful discussion and I hope to see uh, many of you back online in a, a couple of weeks when uh, we will have a discussion centering on the questions of language. Uh, the topic next time is language in American Orthodox liturgical music, liturgical and pastoral perspectives with the panelists, uh, Father John Rasim El Masi, uh, Professor Vitali Permiakov, and also Professor Jessica, Jessica Suchipilalis. So uh, again, a wealth of experience there uh, in the American liturgical scene. So thank you all so much. And thank until you. the next time. It's been great.